Carol Ann. Carol Ann. Hey, I'm right here. Josh? Josh! You okay? Oh my god, where have you been? Nobody has seen you for days. I'm sorry, I've just been so deep in researching some really wild international missing persons cases, and I just fell in the rabbit hole and simply lost track of time. Seriously? Those must be some pretty awesome stories. They're crazy. In fact, two of them in particular, you want to hear them? I'd love to. Want to jump on over into my universe and help me with my missing 411 episode that I'm about to do? Absolutely. Let's do it. Fabulous. Hang on. Nice. I'm just about to do a story right now, but I'll be back with you when I'm done. Can you hang out for a bit? Uh, how, how did you? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I sure can. Sweet! Don't go away. I'll be right back. Welcome to the In Between. I'm Carol Ann, and today, with the help of Josh from What Lurks Beneath, we are fanning out around the world with four stories of people whose radiant lives would be blanketed by the shadow of mystery. The Pennine region in England, between Lancashire and Yorkshire, is commonly referred to as UFO Valley, which means absolutely nothing to Leo Kajia Adamski. Now, not only does it have no bearing on her day-to-day -day life, but especially now, now that she is too busy worrying about her husband, Zygmunt, who's been missing for 12 days. But the person about to knock on her door will change her world forever. Leocadia, or Lottie as she is known, is beside herself. She's a wreck with worry today. Her husband of 29 years, Zygmunt, or Ziggy, has been missing for 12 days now. He went out for a bag of potatoes and never came home. There might be a joke in there somewhere if she didn't feel like her world was crashing down around her. Lottie and Ziggy are Polish immigrants who, after both having nasty run-ins with the Nazis after they invaded Poland in 1939, fled to the Leeds area of the UK. Eventually, they met and were married in 1951. And since they both have had enough drama in Poland, they settle down in the small town of Tingley, just outside of Leeds, to build themselves a nice, quiet life together. And they do a pretty good job of it. Ziggy gets a good, stable job at the coal mine that supports them both. But life is not life without some drama. Since they moved to Tingley, Lottie was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and is now in a wheelchair. But they've managed to build a good community of friends and family and are both well-liked by everybody. Ziggy and Lottie are never able to have any children of their own. So instead, Ziggy kind of leans into his relationship with his goddaughter and the two become pretty close. So close that Ziggy is set to walk her down the aisle for her upcoming wedding. But then it happened. The day before the wedding, Lottie will never forget that day, June 6th, 1980, when her world stopped. Ziggy went shopping that morning with his cousin Laska, who had been staying with them for a couple of months. After the two came home and had lunch with Lottie, Ziggy gets up from the table and announces that he's running down the street because he forgot to buy the potatoes that they're going to need for the next day's festivities. He grabs his striped coat and his wallet and heads out the door. He walks to the store, buys his bag of potatoes, and starts heading back to home, but stops to chat with the neighbors for a few minutes. And that is the last time anyone has seen Ziggy in the last 12 days. The grocery store is like a whole three blocks down the road. So to walk there, buy potatoes and walk back should have taken all of 15, 20 minutes max. So after half an hour, Lottie sends Laska out to see what the problem is. But Ziggy is nowhere. 
Lottie starts calling everyone she can think of and raising the alarm that something is wrong, including calling the police. The police tell her to just sit tight for a day or two and just see what happens. Surely he will be back in time for the wedding. But he wasn't. So she files a missing persons report, and the police start checking around a bit, talking to family, friends, and neighbors. And they talk to one of Ziggy's closest friends, Christopher Solinsky, who'd been out at the pub with Ziggy just two days before he disappeared. He told police that Ziggy seemed like his normal cheery self. He described the Adamski's marriage as happy and said that there's no way that Ziggy would voluntarily disappear and leave his wheelchair-bound wife, Lottie, to fend for herself. No way. But so far, no one has either seen or heard a thing. No leads, no theories, nothing. He's just gone. So Lottie has done nothing for these last 12 days except sit in her chair and pray that God will return her Ziggy. Then a knock at the door. A young man who was visiting Lottie gets up and answers the door for her. Standing on her front steps are a detective and police constable Alan Godfrey. The two officers come in and inform Lottie that they are there because they heard she had filed a missing persons report about her husband. They had some pictures to show her. Pictures, it turns out, of Ziggy. Seven days earlier on June 11th, Alan Godfrey is standing on a stoop having a smoke and trying to stay out of the rain when a call comes on his radio asking officers to respond to an incident at the Tomlinson Coal Yard. I'm on my way. What's going on? The body's been found. As he steps out into the rain, a police car pulls in front of him, driven by his friend and fellow cop Malcolm, who tells him to get in and the two are off to the coal yard. When they get there, they are greeted by two paramedics and Trevor Parker, the son of the coal yard's owner. We think you have a murder, came the greeting from one paramedic. Malcolm and Alan look around, but they don't see a body anywhere. So they both look back at the paramedics, kind of confused. And one paramedic says, look up. So they scan a little higher and spot it. At the very top of one of the coal piles, about 15 feet up, is something that definitely doesn't belong there. The two officers work their way up the pile, the coal constantly shifting under their feet as they go. And Alan notices something. As he and Malcolm are climbing, they're messing up this once perfect pile. But if it was perfect when they got there, how did this body get up there without messing it up? The body is lying face down, so the two men turn it over and, even as seasoned policemen, they are not prepared for what they see. The face that rolls over to greet them is a frozen picture of fear, with eyes wide open and a mouth fixed in a silent scream. Alan recoils for a moment, but then years of training quickly take over and he starts examining the scene. The body is that of an older male wearing a nice brown suit. Interesting though, the suit is perfectly clean, while Alan and Malcolm are now covered in coal dust. How did he climb up here without so much as a smudge of dust on his clothes? Also, there's something off about the suit. The jacket is buttoned wrong, the pants are buttoned wrong, and he's only wearing a string vest under the jacket. It's like someone dressed him in these clothes and got it wrong. And it looks like someone gave him a really bad haircut. Like someone had just taken scissors and hacked away a few bits, some of them down to the scalp. Alan and Malcolm can't see any obvious cause of death, but they do see an open wound on the back of his neck at the base of his skull that looks to have some kind of greenish ointment smear all over it. And they can also see a few um, penny-sized spots around his head and shoulders that look like burn marks. Well, there's not much more that they can do now, so they climb down the pile and call the Criminal Investigation Department. 
while they're waiting for the CID guys, they talk to Trevor Parker, the young man who discovered the body. He says he was at the coal yard this morning and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. The coal yard is just this huge fenced in area with piles of coal all around. And trucks go in and out throughout the day, either bringing in more coal or loading some up to take away. Trevor then leaves for lunch and to check on some of the other coal yards. And when he comes back around 345, he immediately sees something lying on top of one of those piles. He goes to check it out, sees a shoe and calls the paramedics, thinking that it is yet another stray drunk who has found his way into the coal yard. Apparently it happens a lot. The pathologist who did the autopsy, Alan Edwards, noted that this guy had apparently been eating well and wasn't malnourished or dehydrated, although it doesn't look like he ate anything on the day that he died. And there's only about one day's worth of stubble on his face. And the time of death is calculated as being between 11.15 a.m. and 1.15 p.m. on the 11th. So the same day that he was found on the coal pile, so apparently right after Trevor left for lunch. The burn marks around his head and shoulders look like some type of acid burns that he estimates to be about two days old. And the greenish jelly substance over the wound at the base of the skull is tested and they can't identify it. There are no defensive wounds. The only other wounds on the body are a few small um, light cuts on the palms of both of his hands, both knees, and a small cut on the right thigh. The cause of death is ruled as heart failure, or more specifically, a combination of emphysema and ischemic heart disease. In other words, natural causes. Alan Godfrey is tasked with trying to figure out who this John Doe actually is. So, he hits the pavement, checking out shops and pubs in the Todd Morden area, but no one has ever seen this guy. He calls all the area hospitals to see if anyone has been treated for a head wound in the last few days, and nothing. Eventually, someone connects the dots and clues Alan Godfrey into a missing persons report of a man that sounds an awful lot like his John Doe, but it's from Tingley. That's almost 25 miles or 40 kilometers from Todd Merton. What would he be doing out here? But lacking any other leads, Alan and the detective assigned to the case make that fateful trip to Tingley on June 18th, which lands them on Lottie's doorstep. She's heartbroken, but there's really not anything else that she can do but wait for the coroner's inquest to hopefully get some answers as to what the hell happened to her husband. Now, a coroner's inquest is a formal legal investigation conducted by the coroner with the help of the pathologist into a death where either the cause of death or the circumstances surrounding it remain unknown. In Ziggy's case, the coroner sticks to the pathologist's findings that Ziggy dies of natural causes. It's the circumstances surrounding it that are the issue. Despite protestations from Alan and Malcolm, they rule that Ziggy died where he was found. Alan and Malcolm are not even called to testify. Okay, fine. But if he disappeared on the 6th and he died on the 11th, where was he for those five days? And how did he end up at the top of the coal pile? Trevor Parker testified that he was not expecting any deliveries that day, so he didn't come in on a truck and get dumped. And that nice brown suit he was wearing? It wasn't his. Lottie confirmed that those were not the clothes Ziggy was wearing when he left the house. And where are his wallet and watch? The closest thing to a rational explanation to this entire scenario is that Ziggy had been kidnapped by a family member and held in a shed for five days. Remember Ziggy's cousin, Laska? Well, apparently she was staying with Ziggy and Lottie because things were not going well between her and her husband, like restraining order bad. So the theory is that Laska's husband in a fit of rage, 
kidnaps Ziggy and tortures him for five days before Ziggy's heart just can't take it anymore and gives out. And exactly how did he think this would make things better with his wife? But police find zero evidence that this is how things actually went down. It just doesn't make sense. If that's what happened, why would Laska's husband dump Ziggy's body in a wide open area in the middle of the day when the chances of getting caught are pretty high? And if they dragged his dead body to the top of the pile, why aren't Ziggy's clothes covered in soot? And why bother to drag a heavy body to the top of the coal pile? And bonus, if he was dragged up there by someone, how did the pile of coal show no signs of anyone climbing it? Nonetheless, the coroner's inquest concludes with an open finding. In other words, they have no idea. But once the inquest is over, the coroner, James Turnbull, gives an odd statement to the press. The question of where he was before he died and what led to his death could not be answered. In my 12,000 cases, this is the most baffling I've ever had. If I was told a UFO took this man up and dropped him on the coal pile, I would only raise one eyebrow. Sounds like a weird end to a weird story, right? Well, it is, but that's not the end, at least not for Officer Alan Godfrey. As ticked off as he was about the results of the coroner's inquest, he managed to eventually leave all of the unanswered questions in the past and get back to his regular life as a Todd Morton beat cop. Life was pretty much back to normal until the rainy, dreary evening of November 27th, 1980, so just six months after the discovery of Ziggy Adamski's body on the coal pile. Alan has just started his night shift and is on his way to the northwest part of Todmorden to check out a report of a number of escaped cows out on an unsanctioned walkabout. When a second call comes in, somebody else has spotted the cows. But when Alan finally gets there, he doesn't see any cows. And that's when it dawns on him. He's been punked, and so he just heads back to the station. But then a third call comes in from the same neighborhood complaining about the cows. But this time, it's an old lady, not likely a practical joker. So he heads back out there. He gets to the house around midnight and is greeted at the door by a lovely older woman who invites him in and offers him some tea. And she explains that she had been sleeping, but woke up because of some strange noises outside. She looked out the window and she saw five or six cows in the street, puts in her call to the police and goes back to the window to keep tabs on those hooligan cows. It's then that she is hit with a blinding light that lights up her entire house. When the light fades, the cows are gone. Alan suggests that maybe it was just the headlights of a car passing by that scared the cows away. The old woman isn't so convinced. The following morning, toward the end of Alan's all-nighter shift, so now the morning of November 28th, at about 5 a.m., three officers in Halifax are wandering around north of the city around the moors. A moor is a low hilly area covered in only low growing vegetation and is sometimes wet containing peat bogs. So these guys are out there checking out a tip on some stolen motorcycles. All three of them see a blue pulsating light hanging just under the low cloud cover and moving erratically, not like any aircraft any of them have ever seen before. The movements are so wild and unpredictable that one of the officers said, enough of this, I'm going back to the car. The blue light then heads toward the officers, buzzes over the top of them, and takes off at a crazy fast speed in the direction of Todd Morden. About five minutes later, in a little town on the outskirts of northern Manchester called Littleborough, 
two police officers sat in their car in the parking lot of a local pub called the White House when they noticed a blue pulsating light off in the distance hovering between two electrical towers. Oddly enough, neither of them saw the object appear, but they sat there just mesmerized by it. One of the officers makes a sketch drawing of the light while the other radios into the station to let somebody know what it is that they are looking at. They stare at it for a few more minutes before it shoots off at a high rate of speed again towards Todmorden. Roughly five minutes later, so around 5.10 a.m., Alan is getting into his car for his last patrol around town before his shift ends. The rain had finally stopped, but he still had those stupid cows on his mind. So he heads off back toward that area to take one more stab at finding them. He's heading north on Burnley Road when he sees something in the road. About five minutes later, So around 5.15 a.m., Leonard Smith, the caretaker for Fernie Lee Junior School, which is north of Burnley Road, is walking across the school grounds when he notices something dark in the sky to the south of him, so right over Burnley Road. It's hard to see in the morning darkness, but it looks like it is rising from the road. And it zigzags a bit and then shoots off at an insane speed. Around 45 minutes later, Alan's friend and fellow officer, Malcolm, is just leaving the station at the end of his shift when Alan comes racing up in his police car, stops, rolls down the window, and tells Malcolm to get in now. Malcolm really just wants to go home, but Alan's face is pale with a very dire look. So Malcolm gets in the car and thinks, this better be good. It was. Trying to catch his breath and calm down, Alan tells Malcolm about how he was on his way back to the area of the renegade cows. But just as he was about to take a right off of Burnley Road to head north to the area, he sees something in the road about 100 yards in front of him sitting in the middle of Burnley Road. So he passes the turnoff to go north and heads toward the object, thinking it's a bus that's uh, that's crashing his jackknife across the road. But then he realizes that this thing is way bigger than a bus and is floating about five feet off the ground. By Alan's estimates, it's about 20 feet wide and 14 feet tall. And it's actually diamond shaped and in two halves, the top half being stationary and the bottom half rotating. And it has a row of dark windows all the way around. Alan hears no sound, but notices the trees and bushes to the sides of the object are shaking all around as if there's a big wind blowing them all over. But Alan doesn't see or feel any wind. Alan stops his car about 30 feet away from the thing and turns on his blue police lights and hazard lights because whatever it is, it's blocking the entire road. He tries to radio into the police station to let them know there is a problem on Burnley Road, but his personal radio doesn't work. Neither does the radio in the car. So he starts doing what every British constable is taught to do at the site of an accident. Alan takes out his notepad and starts to sketch what he sees. And he remembers starting that sketch, but not finishing it. Because before he has a chance, a brilliant light, like a hundred suns, hits Alan's face. By the time the blindness from the light flash clears, the object is gone. And Alan is another 50 yards up the road with his hands on the steering wheel and the car rolling along in first gear. Blue police lights are off, hazard lights are off, and the headlights of the car are off. Alan quickly turns the car around and goes back. Now, remember, it's been raining all night, so everything is still wet except for that spot on the road. It's dry with a whirlpool pattern of twigs lying on the road. Now, 
It's almost 6 a.m. 30 minutes gone, literally in a flash. Malcolm doesn't know what to say about Alan's story as Alan drives him back to the spot where he saw whatever it is that he saw. And they get out of the car and Malcolm can see the dry circle on the road with the whirlpool of twigs just like Alan had described. He knelt down and touched the dry patch of the road. And despite it being a cold, rainy November morning, the dry patch is warm. They look around and Alan remembers that they are right next to Centervale Park, hoping maybe to find some early morning joggers or dog walkers who had witnessed what Alan had witnessed. They grab their flashlights and head toward the park. They have to cross a small bridge that spans a gully that runs almost the entire length of the park parallel to Burnley Road. And when they get to the main gate, it's locked to climb over the fence and just start walking through the park. And in the pre-dawn darkness, Alan can barely make out the outline of a number of dark shadows moving around on the other side of the park. He shines his flashlight in that direction, only to see, staring right back at him, the faces of a half a dozen cows. In the days and weeks that followed, Alan learned a number of very important things. First, he learned that it would be really hard for cows to wander from the neighborhood where they were first spotted through town, across the road, over the gully next to the road, and through the locked gate of the park. He also learned that the road leading to the house of the little old lady who served him tea while while telling him of the disappearing cows was not situated in a way where lights from oncoming traffic could shine through her windows. Whatever that light was that shined in her house was not from a car. And he learned that all records concerning both Ziggy Adamski's death and his own encounter, including the reports filed to the Ministry of Defense by not only himself, but the three other officers from Halifax as well, are totally locked down as classified. There's actually a lot more to Alan's story than I could cover here, but he wrote a book called Who or what were they that details his entire ordeal that I will link in the description below if you care to take a deeper look into his story. So what plucked Ziggy from the face of the earth, killed him and set him back down on that pile of coal? And what happened in that 30 minute chunk of time that Alan lost that morning on the road? Do they have anything to do with each other? Or are these events just some massive coincidence? As much as I would love to say, the truth is out there. In this case, I'm not sure we're ever going to find it. Are you still there, Josh? I sure am. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Josh Ninocchio from What Lurks Beneath. Frederick Valentick loved three things. His girlfriend Rhonda... UFOs, and flying. Too bad two of those three things would get him in trouble. On the night of October 21st, 1977, Frederick would take off on a flight from mainland Australia, heading for King Island, and then vanish with his last communications to air control, creating a mystery that persists to this very day. You see, his first love, Rhonda, He had met her about six months prior, and it was love at first sight. He had proposed to her on October 13th, just eight days prior to his flight to King Island, but at least everything seemed to be heading in the right direction. Now, his second love, UFOs, apparently Fred believed he had seen one earlier that year and had since been devouring any and all information he could find on the subject. Some reported that he had even mentioned that he had a fear of being taken away by one as he was flying along. Now, this brings us to love number three, flying. 
Unfortunately, this love was playing hard to get. You see, Frederick Valentich was 20 years old in October of 1977 and had already started working on his third love, Flying. He had achieved a Class 4 instrument rating, which meant he could fly anytime he wanted to during the day, but could only fly at night when it was clear and he could see any issues in front of him, so not yet rated to fly by his instruments alone. He had 150 hours of solo flying time under his belt, had applied twice for the Royal Australian Air Force, and had been rejected twice due to the lack of educational qualifications. But flying was Fred's dream, so he just kept on going and applied himself to the RAAF Air Training Corps to continue beefing up his skill set until he would eventually get accepted. Now, unfortunately for Fred, 1977 didn't seem to be his year. Now, in addition to being rejected by the RAAF, his parallel efforts to become a commercial pilot weren't going to be any better. The commercial pilot's exam was a five-part test, and he failed all five. Then he took it again, and failed again. And a third time's a charm, right? No, no. He only passed two of the five and failed the other three in spectacular fashion. In fact, in his brief 150 hours of actual flying time, he had already managed to rack up three reprimands for his erratic flying, two for purposefully flying into a cloud since he had lost all visibility and wasn't rated for instruments only flight and once for entering, well, restricted airspace. But just like the Energizer Bunny, Frederick kept moving forward toward his dream of flying jets, either military or civilian. And that, folks, brings us to the night of October 21st. You see, Frederick then departed Moraben Airport at 6.19 p.m. in his Cessna 182, embarking on a journey expected to last approximately 90 or so minutes, and he flew along the southern coast towards Cape Otway before crossing the Bay Strait towards King Island. Now, King Island is an island between the southern coast of Australia and Tasmania in the Bay Strait. At 7.06 p.m., contact was made between Frederick and air traffic control at Melbourne.
when his plane did not arrive on King Island at 7.33 as scheduled, rescuers were on it and searching within the hour. Now remember, this is in 1977, not exactly today's technology, and from what I can see, the model of Cessna did not have an emergency location beacon, but rescuers had far more advanced rescue procedures than just a mere set of binoculars. But after seven days, they found nothing but one oil slick that had turned out to be regular gas, not airplane fuel. And for the skeptics out there, Frederick wasn't the only one to see things in the area that day. In fact, on the same day, October 21st, there were at least 50 distinct sightings of different phenomena. Now at 2 p.m. that day, eyewitnesses on King Island had reported seeing a UFO emerge from a strange cloud. It was a clear day and the sky had zero clouds, except for the one that the ship flew out of. Hmm. At 4.30 p.m. that same day, there were multiple sightings of not one, but two cigar-shaped objects connected by silver beams, about three quarters the size of a Boeing 747 right over the Bay Strait. Now at 6.45 p.m. that evening, the sunset by the Cape Otway Lighthouse was so beautiful that a man named Roy Manifold had decided to take out his camera trying to capture the beautiful magic on film taking six consecutive shots. When it was over, he goes inside his house and he heard the sounds of a light aircraft flying over his house. Now, he didn't connect the dots until later when he got the film developed and noticed a strange imperfection on the last one. Now, at first, he thought the picture had been messed up by whoever developed them, but then he realized that he'd taken these pictures the very same day that Frederick Valentich had vanished and that it must have been his plane he had heard fly over his house that night. Now, the picture has been studied by a number of people who all agree it's pretty legit. Roy's son, Jason, says that he was with his dad that night and that after his dad had taken the pictures and had gone back inside the house, Jason heard the sound of an aircraft engine. It was already dark, so he couldn't see it, but he could hear it. But instead of fading off into the distance, like you would expect a plane engine sound to do, he distinctly heard the engine stop, as if somebody had just shut it off. Now, other people reported seeing strange green lights in the sky all throughout the day, and another witness even claims that they saw Valentich's plane in a steep dive, followed closely by a trail of green light. And if that's not all weird enough, a farmer in Adelaide, which is about roughly 400 miles to the northwest of Cape Otway, was sitting in his tractor in the middle of a field the next morning and he saw a large craft hovering right over his property. Now, according to the farmer, seemingly stuck to that craft was a Cessna. This thing was so close to him that he claimed he could see the Cessna was leaking either oil or fuel. And so he quickly pulled out a sharp object and scratched the serial number off the Cessna into his tractor. But when he tried to tell people what he saw, he was ridiculed so badly that he just shut his mouth and only told a few family and friends. Fred reported that the engine was idling roughly, but doesn't say anything else that would lead to this conclusion. And for some reason, if his plane did explode midair, or if the engine stopped and he ended up ditching it in the water, why wouldn't we have some wreckage left over? Now, it's important to note that the base strait in that area is only about 150 feet deep. I mean, you would think that the wreckage could be found at that depth. I mean, they found the Titanic and that's 13,000 feet. Now, early on, it was suggested that somehow Frederick had managed to accidentally invert his plane and was flying upside down. So the lights he saw above him were actually his own lights reflected in the water below him. Now, given the effects of gravity, I don't know how it's even possible to not know you're upside down, but I guess it happens. Does the name John Kennedy Jr. ring a bell? But if that were the case, the engine would have stalled out immediately, not just been sputtering. Now, in 2013, a U.S. Air Force pilot proposed given the direction he was heading, that the four white lights that Fred saw might have actually been a set of celestial bodies visible at the time, 
Mars, Mercury, Venus, and a star known more commonly as Antares. These four white lights in the sky, which would have been in a diamond shape, could have appeared to Fred with his limited flying experience as the landing lights of another plane. Then Frederick was confused by what is known as the illusion of a tilted horizon. Now, this is when the horizon looks like it's at an angle, but it's actually not. So what happens is you start tilting your plane to stay level with the horizon, but instead you're actually beginning a downward spiral, which would slowly choke off your fuel supply, making your engine sputter, and well, we know what happens then. Now the instruments will always be correct, but remember, Fred is not an instrument pilot yet. Of course, he could read the instruments, but he was probably more likely to rely on what he could see. The green light, they say, could have just been one of Fred's own landing lights reflecting into the cockpit. Now, people say Frederick loved UFOs a little too much and that maybe he staged this entire flight just to hoax a sighting of his own. I mean, skeptics will even point to the fact that he told his family that he was going to King Island to pick up some crayfish, but told everyone else that he was picking up some passengers. Well, apparently there were no crayfish waiting for him, and considering he originally tried making his run a few days earlier, but wasn't allowed to fly due to poor weather conditions, I mean, it's doubtful there were people waiting to be transported either. And while he filed a flight plan with the Moribin Airport in Melbourne, he never did contact the airport on King Island. And that airport didn't have someone in their tower 24 seven, so you needed to call ahead to make sure someone was going to be there. And guess who didn't do that? Yeah, Fred. He also made sure that his fuel tanks were full. I mean, he had three times the fuel he needed to get to King Island. So speculation is that Fred never actually intended to land, that his plan was to go up, fly around for a while, and maybe hoax a sighting and come back, maybe claiming some missing time or something. And then not being a very good pilot, wandered off course, flying around until he ran out of fuel or had that catastrophic engine failure. Now, on the darker side of things, people note that he was having serious issues attaining his dream of a career as a pilot. Maybe, just maybe he was so despondent that he figured this was the easiest way out and would at least be the least painful for friends and family. But the problem with the hoax theory is that Fred's brother claims that while Fred was very interested in UFOs, he was no more interested than anyone else at that time. I mean, you gotta remember, UFOs were a very popular subject in the 1970s, and it was hard to avoid watching or even reading about them. And why would Fred want to commit suicide? I mean, he had just gotten engaged eight days before this flight. He had very supportive friends and family who all said he seemed as happy as ever. And considering his last two rejections by the RAAF were because of his apparent lack of experience, I mean, who knows? Maybe Fred just wanted to get more hours on his record. Or did he really get taken away by a UFO? I mean, the numerous sightings in the area both before and after this incident lend credence to the idea that strange things were happening in the skies of Melbourne right at this time. In 1978, there were so many sightings that the period is now known, more famously, as the 1978 Tasmania Victoria UFO wave. And also, there was never any wreckage of Fred's plane ever recovered, considering how quickly the search began when he didn't arrive on King Island when expected, if there was a crash, there should have been something left over, right? Anything. But there was one piece of airplane debris a cow flap that washed up five years later on Flinders Island. Now, Flinders Island is about 200 miles to the east of King Island, and this particular part doesn't float, so the current would have had to have dragged it on the ocean floor the entire 200 miles. In fact, oceanographers say that the current in the strait may have been strong enough to push the piece the whole distance, but that assumes there was nothing on the ocean floor the entire distance for it to get hung up on. Also, it was never confirmed to be from Fred's plane. The part was broken and corroded by the time it made it to Flanders Island. So the serial number was only partially readable. 
However, what they could read confirmed that it came from a range of numbers that included Fred's plane. Now, that said, there were two other planes just like the one Fred was flying that reported losing that same piece, that cow flap, upon takeoff in areas much closer to Flanders Island and more recently within that five years time span. Now, another thing to keep in mind when weighing all of these facts and theories is that the area Fred flew through is often referred to as the Bay Strait Triangle. And while there really isn't a triangle per se, the name is just taken from the more famous Bermuda Triangle, the stretch of water separating mainland Australia from Tasmania is a hotbed of strange disappearances and reported paranormal activity. And considering it's only about 120 by 190 miles, that's not really a lot of area considering the list of incidents that it has racked up. Now, remember Roy Manifold? The guy we actually talked about earlier, you know, who took the picture of the unknown object in the sky and his son Jason, who had heard the plane engine turn off? Well, an eerily similar incident had actually happened 44 years earlier, and it gets even weirder because it was almost to the day. Going back in October of 1934, while crossing the Bay Strait in perfect weather conditions for flying, mind you, the airliner dubbed the Miss Hobart vanished without a trace with 11 people on board. No wreckage was ever discovered, despite extensive searches by military aircraft and vessels. Aviation experts call the loss of the Miss Hobart to be a genuine mystery, not least due to the fact that the de Havilland DH-86 aircraft was the most reliable aircraft of its time, although there are some who would refute that claim. Now, the last transmission from the Miss Hobart is like a pre-echo of what Jason Manifold would say 44 years later. The crew allegedly claimed they could hear the sound of a plane around them and could see an aerial machine coming toward them. They then reported that the humming sound had just suddenly ceased. This was the last anyone would hear from the Miss Hobart. Now, in December of 1979, so just a year after Fred's plane went missing, a yacht named Charleston, along with its five crew members, all vanished without a trace while sailing along the Bay Strait, on its way to Sydney for New Year's Eve and to participate in the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. So I think it's safe to say that the crewmen knew their way around a boat. Not a trace of either the crew or the boat was ever found. Now, during World War II, 17 military planes were lost in the strait during the war. Interesting, considering that there was no warfare conducted in the area, only training missions. I guess they needed the training. Now, some of the ones who actually lived told some pretty fantastical tales. Like in 1942, an Australian fighter pilot actually followed orders to fly his plane over the area to investigate reports of strange lights made by fishermen. Now, as he surveyed the area, a huge brown metallic disc actually came up out of the clouds only to fly alongside the plane for several moments before shooting off and vanishing. Now, in 1944, a pilot had reported a strange dark shadow that would appear suddenly and flew beside his bomber for almost 20 minutes. Then, without warning, it just shot upward at an unfathomable speed and disappears. And airplanes are not the only victims of the Bay Strait Triangle. In fact, many a seafaring voyage has ended in disaster in these same mysterious waters. The first recorded incident is the disappearance of the Eliza in 1797. Another ship called the Sydney Cove had wrecked on the rocks not far off the coast, and the Eliza was on its way to the Sydney Cove to rescue the crewmen and allegedly vanished along the way. In 1858, the British ship HMS Sappho went missing. In 1906, you had the SS Ferdinand Fischer, a German cargo ship, again, vanished. But my favorite is the SS Amelia J on September 10th, 1920. The schooner SS Amelia J entered the waters of the strait and seemingly vanished into the ether. 
A search was launched to find the wayward ship by the Australian military. The HMAS Swordsman was ordered to head toward Amelia's last known location, and while searching the base straight for any sign of her, another ship, the SS Southern Cross, had also vanished. So the military sends out an airplane to help the HMAS Swordsman search for both missing ships now, which also vanishes. Wreckage from the SS Southern Cross was eventually found on King Island, but the Amelia J and the airplane were never seen again. A series of unfortunate events. Hmm, maybe. But this series of vanishings is also accompanied by reports of strange lights in the area, making it the real first recorded occurrence in the Bay Strait that could actually be connected with potential UFO activity. Now, undoubtedly, a certain number of the copious list of missing planes and ships in this relatively small area met their fate due to known phenomena like such as storms or pilot error. And if some other as of yet unknown natural phenomenon exists, scientists have yet to discover what it might be. The ultimate fate of Frederick Valentik and his Cessna will most likely never be known. And unless a new explanation for the absolute plethora of ships, planes, and even people that have gone missing over the years in this area, the Bay Strait Triangle, more mysteries like Fred's are likely to be born. Holy crap, I've been to that area of Australia, but I certainly didn't know that I was that close to the danger zone. Great story. Okay, for the next one, we go to the very top of Norway. <sighs> Sounds cold. Let me grab a blanket. Word of warning, I do not speak one word of Norwegian, so I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any of these places or names. Norway has a royal family, and they're pretty popular with the Norwegian people. But in the 1990s, the people elected a new royal family, at least temporarily, led by two brothers, Kjetil and Fagar Ulvang. See, there's not a whole lot going on in Norway, except cross-country skiing, and it is as popular of a sport there as football is in the U.S. If you look at the cumulative Olympic medal totals for cross-country skiing for each country, Norway rules. It's not even close. But in the 70s and 80s, Olympic gold medals were few and far between. That is, until the 1992 Winter Olympic Games in Albertville, France. Vegar was the brother actually on the skis, but Kjetil, an accomplished skier and athlete in his own right, was a trained and certified physical therapist for the Norwegian Olympic ski teams. So the brothers went to Albertville together. By the time the games were over, Vegar and his teammate Bjorn Dali had each won three golds and a silver medal for a total of eight between them. That's six of Norway's nine gold medals and eight of Norway's 20 medals total just from these two guys. Vegar came home in style on a plane that Scandinavian Airlines rechristened Vegar the Viking in his honor, a nickname that has stuck with them to this day. And seemingly overnight, the entire Ulvang family is elevated to hometown hero status by all of Norway. But the Ulvangs are far from real royalty. Kjetil was born in 1961 to parents Arn and Ingrid. He was followed by his brother Vegar in 1963 and another brother Morten in 1965. The family lived in Schirkenes, Norway, where Arne and Ingrid were teachers at the Schirkenes High School and taught their three boys the importance of being physically fit. Schirkenes is way in the northern regions of Norway and only about five miles from the border with Russia. It's actually located within the Arctic Circle. So they see winter from September to May with not a ton of snow since their temperatures are probably a bit tempered by being on the coast of the Barents Sea, but 
it's certainly enough to ski on. So from the time they can strap skis on their feet, all three Ulvang brothers could be seen skiing around the Shikinis area. And these guys are tough. They run or ski day or night, which is good because the winter months that far north are mostly dark. If you want to ski in the winter, you either have to go to a ski park that has lights or strap a light on your head. So that's what they do. And a 10-mile run in the winter with wind and snow is a regular day at the office for these guys. They are truly a different breed of athlete. Kittel and Fegar are super tight. With a shared passion for skiing, they are not only brothers, but best friends. But they don't do everything together. Vegar is kind of this larger-than-life adventure seeker, while Kettle is more content to stay home, finding his joy in his professional calling of physical therapy. Not that the brothers don't adventure together occasionally. Vegar has this thing about mountains, probably because there's nothing taller than a thousand feet in his neighborhood and nothing over 7,000 feet in all of Norway. And he's climbed a good number of the big ones. In the summer of 1990, Kjetil Vegar and another friend, Pierre Gaypere, who was an experienced mountain climber who had guided Vegar up other daunting slopes, they all traveled to Alaska to summit Denali, a 20,000 foot or 6,100 meter climb. Gay Pere had done the same climb solo three years earlier and was a little worried about the Ulvang boys' ability to complete this summit. But using standard Ulvang grit and determination, they made the summit in 11 days using the route most people use to climb Denali. But on the way down, they took a less traveled route. And after seven days of hiking down, they were attempting to cross a frozen lake on skis. Now, they knew there was a danger of the ice being too thin. It was summer in Alaska. So they would use an, an ice hatchet to check the thickness every couple hundred feet. At one point, Kieto got out in front of the other two by about 50 feet when the ice gave way, sending Kieto into the frigid water with no way to pull himself out. He calmly took off his skis and laid them across the opening to give himself something he could put his arms up on, um, something for him to lean on and support him while he waited to be rescued. And Vigar tied himself to Pierre and started to move out onto the ice in an attempt to reach Kettle, but the ice gave way again, sending both Vigar and Pierre into the water as well. They're both able to scramble back to shore on their own. Then Pierre takes a shot at skiing out to Kettle, but falls in again. After he gets himself out, Vegar ties a rope to a rock and tosses it out to Kettle, who manages to get the rope around his arm. But while he's waiting for Vegar to pull him out, Pierre goes through the ice again. Vegar ends up pulling both of them out across and through the jagged ice. Pierre suffers from a few cuts, but after being in the near freezing water for almost 15 minutes, Kettle is going into shock. And while Vegar stays with him to try to warm him, Pierre goes running for a small logging village not far away. And as he comes face to face with one of the residents, both his bleeding face and his frantic calls for help in a French accent probably took the resident a little by surprise. But Pierre manages to get his point across and park rangers are called. The rangers send a helicopter to get Kettle, who, by the time help arrives, has been revived by Vegar and goes on to make a full recovery. That is one tough dude. This guy, Kettle, is said to be in such great physical shape that he can run for up to 12 to 15 hours. How nuts is that? 
which is also why his disappearance is such a mystery. In the fall of 1993, Vegard travels to the Dolomite Mountains in Italy to ramp up his training for the 1994 Olympics, which are being held in his home country in Lillehammer. By the way, just a side note here. Rumor has it that the youngest Ulvang brother, Morten, was the fastest skier of all the Ulvangs. But once he saw what his brother Vegar went through with his training regimen, Morten just kind of said, hmm, no thanks. So anyway, Vegar is gone to Italy. And on October 13th, Kettel and Morten make plans to watch the Norway-Poland World Cup elimination soccer game on TV that night at Kettel's house where he lives with his girlfriend, Trina. But first, Kettel is spending the day with two other physiotherapists at a school not far away in Bugoinus, where they work with students on everything from proper posture to fitness training. As the three of them drive back to Shirkinus, they make a pit stop in Naiden, where Kettle chats with a young skier and her father and give them a training program for her to follow. He gets back in the car, but gets out again at a place called Munkinessa. Now, if you search Google for Munkinessa, it'll show you a town on the southwestern coast of Norway. That's not it. But I found a Munkefjord around what would have been their route home. So, as near as I can tell, Kettle gets out of the car somewhere in this area with a plan to run home. Keep in mind that he's starting about 15 miles from his house. But for him, that should be about a two-hour run, which puts him home in plenty of time to watch the game with his brother. The wind is starting to blow, the snow is starting to fall, and the temperature is right around freezing. But this is a walk in the park for him. He literally grew up running all over this terrain. He knows it like the back of his hand. So he gets out of the car, straps on a belt to hold a water bottle. He's wearing a wool hat, a wool sweater under a windbreaker, full-length training pants, running shoes, and waterproof socks. Doesn't sound very warm for freezing temperatures, but when you're running, it's more than enough. And he starts running. And even though Kettel is going to have to go up and over a roughly 1,000 foot rise in an area with no clear path, the people in the car just watch him go and then drive away because they know this is a walk in the park for him. Nobody is worried that Kettel can't make this run. But when Morton shows up at his house later that evening to watch the game and Kettel isn't there, he knows something is not right. Kettel should have been home hours ago. Morton immediately calls his uncle and a friend and the three of them go out to run Kettel's most likely path home. And they find tracks that they're pretty sure must be Kettel's, but after about a mile, they lose the trail. By now, it's like 9.30 at night, and the weather is really turning for the worse. So the searchers build a bonfire at the highest point in the area, hoping Kettle will see it and head in their direction. But all is silent on the mountain. The next day, news that Kettel, one of Norway's own favorite sons, is missing, spreads like wildfire through Shirkenes, and hundreds of volunteers rally together to start a search, including Vegar, who drops everything he's doing in Italy and hops on a plane home to search for his missing brother and best friend. The whole Uvang family straps on their skis and covers countless miles, day and night, looking for any sign of Kettel. And Norwegian officials pull out all the stops, sending 125 soldiers, volunteers, military helicopters equipped with FLIR, and trained canines to help search. Over 120 square miles of terrain is covered in multiple directions, turning up nothing. Police call off the official search after only four days because of the expense, which sounds super short, but that's actually double the normal time allotted for a missing person's search. 
But as soon as the official search and rescue teams back off, Herbert Randall, president of the Shirkinus Ski Club, steps up. He organizes hundreds of volunteers and puts out a call for anyone who might have any knowledge of what happened to Kettle. They get 90 phone calls from mediums and psychics claiming to see him, but none of the information they share leads to anything. For the next 12 days, donations of money and time pour in. At one point, 43 search dogs are in the field and businesses are giving their employees time off with pay so they can join in on what becomes the largest ground search in the history of Norway at the time. But no one finds a thing. By the middle of November, daylight is down to just a couple of hours a day and the search is ended since it's pretty much a given at this point that Kettle is not going to be found alive. So the search ends, but the speculation is just beginning. There are a few reports from people saying that they saw a jogger along the road that night, and a taxi driver even goes so far as to say that the jogger he saw was wearing a belt with a water bottle. So maybe the weather gets bad enough in the hills that Kietl decides to finish his run along the road instead. Vegar says it's possible, but it's pretty rare for anyone to run along that road. But if that's the case, that leads us to a much darker tangent to the theory. Because of Shirkiness's close proximity to Russia and its location effectively on the coast of the Barents Sea, Shirkiness is a popular destination for smugglers and bootleggers. Is it possible that Kittel has either seen something he shouldn't or maybe even just got hit by a car on its way to the coast to deliver goods bound for the Russian black market? Well, if so, whomever these smugglers are, they can't afford to be either identified to the police or caught up in an accident investigation. So they would probably just ditch Kittel's body. It's possible. For Vegar, this has to be the right track. This or some other outside influence. Because the idea that Kieto lost his way in the snow and fell into a lake or something is inconceivable. Kieto has traversed that ridge a hundred times. They've run over every rock on that ground, usually in the dark. And Kieto was as tough as they come. So even if he did fall and get hurt or something, he's the kind of guy who would drag himself five miles to get help. I mean, we've already seen him deal with falling in a frigid lake for 15 minutes and survive like a boss. So for Vegar, there is just no plausible scenario of any kind of trouble that Kieto could run into that he couldn't handle. Just not in the realm of possibility. But whether it's possible or not possible makes no difference. Kieto is nowhere to be found. After three weeks of searching with his family and friends, Vegar returns to Italy to resume his training for the 94 Olympics, which are now only three months away. When a reporter asks him how his training is going, he says, It's strange. For an athlete, the Olympics mean having a deep concern about the small details of his physique. Small muscles, small sore throats, small blisters, small aches. I was here in Italy concentrating completely on these details when I heard about Kieto. I went home and for those three weeks, I didn't think for one second about the Olympics or the details of my physique. In truth, at that time, the games became such a lesser event in my life that they didn't exist at all. And whether it's the interruption of his training or just the complete mental, physical, and emotional toll of his brother still being missing, the cost is evident in the games at Lillehammer in February of 94. Vegar only comes home with one bronze medal. 
not exactly what he and Norway were hoping for. And that was the last Olympics he would compete in. Spring finally arrives in Chickenis, and in June, the military takes to the air again with new searches aimed at, at least, bringing Kjetil home to his family. And it doesn't take long for searchers to spot Kjetil's red jacket. Authorities recover Kjetil's body from a shallow lake about five miles from where they expected his path would take him, which makes absolutely no sense since Morton knew exactly where to start looking for Kieto, it is apparent that although there's no real trail across the mountain, Kieto must have had a favorite route. And this run was not a training opportunity. This was just Kieto grabbing a chance to get in a quick run before sitting down with Morton in front of the TV for the evening. And add the poor weather on top of things, it seems pretty unlikely that Kieta would have strayed too far off of his regular route. And knowing the terrain as well as he did, it also seems unlikely that if he did get off track, that it would take him five miles to figure it out and get back on track. The coroner says the cause of death may have been hypothermia. What does that mean? Obviously, there are no apparent wounds to take investigators in the direction of foul play, but they should at least be able to tell with a little bit more certainty if Kettle died of hypothermia or not. But we can speculate until the cows come home. Doesn't really matter because nothing changes the fact that Kettle is dead and no one has any idea why. But Unlike the usual phrase, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, this time the Lord taketh away and the Lord giveth. Remember I said that Kieta lived with his girlfriend? It's only after he goes missing that Trina finds out she's pregnant. And seven months later, all in the span of the same week, Kietel is found on Sunday in Jorgen, Kettle's nine-pound baby boy is born on Tuesday, just in time to bury his father on Friday. That's crazy and cold. For this last story, let's go someplace much, much warmer, please. The island of Malta. Michael Manschult was the perfect kid with the perfect life. The middle of three children to parents, Bernd and Suzanne, Michael lived in Oldenburg, Germany, but it doesn't sound like he spent a whole lot of time there. Well, when he was five, five years old, his entire family sailed around the Atlantic for two years. And while his parents divorced, Mike remained very close to his father, traveling with him to Canada and Alaska, where the two pan for gold, a dream come true for Bernd, who was a goldsmith, mind you, canoed 250 miles down the Yukon River, then topped it off by mountain biking the top of the world highway from Dawson to Alaska. Mike and his dad even had the next adventure planned. They were going to Iceland in 2017 to compete in their first ever marathon together as present for Mike's 18th birthday. He was only 17 years old but had already started training to get ready. But even with all of this travel and adventure, Mike still managed to graduate from high school in the spring of 2016 at the very top of his class, mind you. Deciding at a young age to pursue aeronautical engineering, he applied for and beat out hundreds of other applicants for a highly, highly coveted apprenticeship at Airbus. Now, with such a charmed life, what might be missing? Love? Well, he had that too. Mike's girlfriend was taking English lessons on the island of Malta. So before she came home, they decided that Mike would come and visit for a few days. Malta, an island just south of Italy and just a bit north of Africa. It's actually one of the smallest nations in the world, measuring no more than 122 square miles in total across the three islands and is home to roughly 400,000 people. 
everyone in Malta seems to own a car, which makes driving and parking a particularly fun treat. Yeah, it's a dry climate with jagged white cliffs plunging into indigo waters below, sun-drenched historic villages, charmed tourists who come to visit one of the best sea and sun destinations in the world. Colorful fishing boats dot the harbors of the capital. Valletta, everywhere you look, is postcard perfect. Mike flew down alone his first vacation without his parents on July 8th. He and his girlfriend made the most of their time together, walking the beaches and exploring the rich history of the island for nine full days until she returned home on July 17th. Mike, however, planned to stay behind to explore solo for a few more days to return on July 22nd. On his first day as a solo traveler, July 18th, Mike texted his family telling them of his plans to rent a bike and explore the southern shores of the island. The bike was due back that evening, but it was never returned and no more texts or calls were ever received from Mike. When he didn't get back off his flight back home at the Bremen airport, Mike's mom and sister tried not to worry, but did anyway. They tried calling him, but only got his voicemail. At two in the morning, Suzanne called the Oldenburg police and reported him missing, only to find out that he was already on the Maltese police's radar presumably as a possible bike thief. When Mike didn't return his bike, the shop owner reported him to the Malta police. Police in Malta had been looking for him, but hadn't found anything. The case was then reported straight to the Bundeskriminalamt, that is the German Federal Criminal Police Office, BKA. Mike's father, Bernd was vacationing in Croatia when his ex-wife had informed him about the situation and came home right away. Mike's parents were outraged that neither Malta nor German police had ever bothered to call and tell them. Mike's mom stays in Germany to help the police from there, but Mike's dad and brother Daniel fly to Malta to help with the search. German police were able to then establish that Mike did not leave Malta on another flight nor did he leave by ferry to any of the neighboring islands. There was no sign of Mike, the bike, or any of his belongings anywhere. And now Maltese police were able to construct at least a partial timeline of Mike's movements. They checked the CCTV cameras at the Hotel Astra where Mike was staying, and on the morning of the 18th of July, Mike came out of his hotel room, number 105, at 8.39 a.m. wearing a blue t-shirt with a dark backpack flung over his shoulder and his cell phone in hand. One half hour later, he returned to his room, called the front desk to get his bill. Then he left his hotel room again at 9.55 a.m., made his way down to the harbor, rented a bike. He sent a message to his girlfriend using WhatsApp shortly after 10 in the morning, telling her, the roads are so steep, I'll send a photo. You can only climb up in some parts. You can't get up there with a bike. It's a sporting challenge, and I like it. This was the last message anyone had received from Mike. Investigators were able to then establish that Mike spent his day sightseeing. His first stop at the ancient Roman catacombs in Rabat, just over 10 miles from Slima. Bernd and Daniel searched the island themselves looking for Mike, and everyone had heard there was a German teenager missing, but no one had seen him. Eight days after he was last seen alive, on the 26th of July 2016, police then received an anonymous tip saying that there was a body at the bottom of the Dingley Cliffs. Malta has many rugged rock faces, and this one is the biggest. At 750 feet all along the west coast of Malta, and a super popular tourist destination, Bernd was there as his son's body was recovered. Mike was lying on the rocks below, it kind of tucked under an overhanging ledge, so no one would have really been able to see him from above, and it looked like maybe he had fallen from a rock 100 feet above. His sneakers and sunglasses were nearby, and the bike was halfway up the hill with a seat facing sideways, a flat tire, and some scratches, but otherwise in pretty decent shape. 
his backpack and his cell phone are nowhere to be seen. The temperature had been pretty hot, almost 100 degrees during the days after his disappearance, so his body had just been lying in the blistering sun for eight days and was so badly decomposed that it couldn't be identified. But between the bike, shoes, and sunglasses, well, investigators assumed that it was Mike, which DNA testing would later confirm to be true. One of the doctors at the scene told Barron that Mike's back had been broken in two places and that he would have died quickly and not suffered. But the autopsy results listed the cause of death as unascertained. So how did Mike die? Well, the logical assumption was that it was an accident, that somehow by cycling, Mike lost control of the bike and fell off the cliff. A couple of weeks after Mike's body was found, someone working at the morgue had pulled Baron aside and told him there were no fractures on Mike's body. The woman whispered and said that she was providing the information off the record. So what did that even mean? And why wouldn't that be on the record? So Baron told the lead investigator about the tip from the morgue worker, but she didn't seem interested. Now at this point, Baron's suspicions start to raise. Was there more to his son's death than he was being told? So he begins asking questions of his own. The deeper Baron dug, the more he realized that the Maltese authorities were not doing a very good job. His own common sense was bothered by the scene where Mike's body was discovered and right next to his body was freshly cut grass, right next to a decaying body. Baird asked the farmer who owned the adjacent land if he knew who cut the grass, but he didn't know. Baird also asked the man if he had seen Mike's backpack, and the man's reaction would surprise him. He looked as if he knew something, but didn't want to say anything. So he had reported that conversation to the lead investigator as well, but again, she did not think it was significant. Now, the biggest thing on Barron's radar was the fact that Mike's GoPro was missing. Initially, he was told that it was on Mike's belt when he was found, which did make sense. Anyone who ever traveled with Mike, including all the people he had met while he was in Malta, had confirmed that Mike usually had his GoPro in a clip on his belt, kind of important since there's a good chance it would have been recording during his last moments. Yet, when Baron asked the police about it, they didn't know what he was talking about. He reminded the investigator that she said that there had been a black case on Mike's belt and that there were witnesses there when she said it. And she just said, I never said that. So when the forensic team was done, Baron was given all of Mike's belongings. Among them was a Canon camera with a bad memory card, not a GoPro. Mike never even owned a Canon. What was not there was his Samsung Galaxy phone, which he used to send his last WhatsApp message, his wallet with credit cards and 600 euros in cash and his backpack. By now, Barrett had no trust in the Maltese police and felt like he was the only one trying to figure out what really happened to his son but his gut told him that it wasn't incompetence, but that they shh, were hiding something. Baird asked again about Mike's missing belongings and the police began to get angry. They went on a rant about how Maltese people don't steal and that if stuff was missing, then it must have been stolen by tourists. Baird gives up for the time being on his investigation in Malta, returns home with his son's body, arriving in Bremen on August 17th. Mike's body was sent to a funeral home to be prepared for his memorial service. It was Mike's 18th birthday. He was supposed to be running the Reykjavik Marathon with his dad. Instead, his body was in a casket. Now here is where the mortician raised a red flag to the police in Oldenburg. When he first received the coffin containing Mike's body from Malta, it seemed light for someone of Mike's age and height. 
and outside the smell of some preservation chemicals, there were no signs that the body had been embalmed, which is a pretty big oversight on the part of whoever had taken care of the body in Malta, because when a body is being transferred, especially between countries, extra measures of preservation are required before ever sending the body home. So the mortician looked closer and discovered that most of Mike's organs had been removed, including his brain, heart, lungs, stomach, small intestine, and oddly enough, one kidney. And the organs that remained were very damaged. All of his remains only weighed 35 pounds. Now, usually during an autopsy, there is an external examination and an internal examination. Now, for the internal examination, the organs are examined in place before they are removed. Each organ is removed, weighed, measured, and samples are taken. When they're done, the organs are placed back in the body and the body is sewn back up. So, if Mike's body had been examined correctly, all of his body parts would have been placed back into his body before he was sent to Germany. And if organs were missing, the coroner would make a note on the paperwork to inform the funeral director, you know, so they wouldn't be wondering why there are missing pieces. Assuming that the coroners in Malta simply forgot to put the organs back in the body after the autopsy, Bernd wrote a letter to the Maltese authorities and the forensic department at Modern Day Hospital asking them to send the missing organs back home to Germany. Mario Seri, who is a highly respected forensic doctor in Malta, informed Bernd that the organs were missing before the first ever autopsy. He said that it had been consumed by rodents and that the brain must have liquefied over the many days of very intensive heat. Now, this little disagreement between Bernd and the Maltese coroner's office now becomes a legal matter and the Oldenburg prosecutor's office takes possession of Mike's body and sends him to the forensic lab at the University of Hanover for a second autopsy. German pathologists found no injuries whatsoever on Mike's body that would be anywhere consistent with the falling off of a cliff, let alone one that was 100 feet. And they confirm what the morgue employee in Malta told Bernd that there was no fractures or superficial injuries of any kind, not one broken bone in his entire body. This was true. Pretty hard to believe if Mike had actually fallen 100 feet down a jagged cliff face. And the missing organs? Well, the German forensic scientist said that there were no bite marks anywhere on Mike's body. So not rodents or any other animals. His skull was not broken and there were no signs of blunt force trauma. They also disagree with the idea that the brain had liquefied because there was no trace of any brain matter left, liquid or otherwise. Mike could have died due to internal bleeding, but without the organs, they can't say for sure. Also, Mike's hyoid bone was gone, which, if damaged, is usually an indication that someone had been strangled. But again, with no organs to examine, that too was impossible to determine. In the end, the German autopsy is also inconclusive. The silver lining to the ambiguity is that the German officials also can't rule out foul play. So Mike's death was ruled a criminal case, allowing the Germans to kick off their own investigation. And it didn't take long for the Germans to figure out that the Maltese didn't do a very good job. Starting from scratch, they would consider all possibilities. First up, suicide. Not likely. They were looking at the death of a young man with a full and vibrant, happy life. Mike was looking forward to the future and had no reasons or intentions to ever kill himself. And the way his body was found was not consistent with someone who had tried to jump off a cliff above. I mean, if that were the case, the body would not have fallen under the rock ledge, not to mention that there were no bruises or broken bones. So. After a hot minute, they rule out suicide. They also ruled out the idea that he had gone over the cliff's edge by accident. If this was the case, his bike would have been much closer to his body. Now, one theory was that it was a hit and run, that a car had hit and killed him, and then realizing what they had done, the driver got some help to carry Mike's body and his bike down the cliff and hide him. 
Then they took Mike's backpack and GoPro in an attempt to conceal evidence. But if this was the case, Mike could have died from his injuries. And without the internal organs, well, we can't tell for sure. But Mike had no broken bones or external bruising, so he probably wasn't hit by a car. Another idea that investigators considered was that Mike was hit by a stray bullet. Dingley Cliffs are one of the few places in Malta where bird hunters go, but hunting is only permitted in spring and autumn, and Mike died in the middle of summer, and Mike's body did not appear to have any bullet wounds. Maybe it was a robbery gone wrong. Maybe somebody saw Mike, a young kid, an obvious tourist, traveling all by himself and figured he'd be an easy target. I mean, if that were the case, there would most likely be some kind of a struggle. If he had been hit somewhere on his abdomen, he could have suffered internal bleeding. And again, without his organs, it was impossible to prove. But what are the chances that a robber is going to stick around long enough to even know Mike was dead, much less take the time to carry him down the cliffside? Of course, the incredibly dark elephant in the room is that Mike was targeted by organ traffickers. That meant that Mike would have been taken to another location, his organs removed, and then his body was dumped at the bottom of Dingley Cliffs, along with his bike and shoes. Malta is not high on the list for organ trafficking, but it is possible. The closest known hub for organ traffickers is in Egypt, so not exactly close, and no cases of organ trafficking have ever been reported in Malta. Both Maltese and German investigators ruled this one out pretty quickly just because of where he was found, not a likely spot for a body dump. Now, the most plausible theory is that Mike had already made it down to the bottom of the cliff to explore. I mean, there is a path. It's steep, but it is doable, especially for another athletic marathoner in training. And when he attempted to climb his way back up, he hoisted the bike onto his shoulders and starts climbing. Now, the path has lots of loose rocks, and maybe Mike lost his footing, fell, and was incapacitated by his injuries. It was hot that day, and he would have been lying in the severe heat, exhausted and injured for hours. Maybe he abandoned the bike and made his way to the spot under the rock ledge, looking for shade, and took off his shoes in an attempt to cool down. But if he was conscious enough to look for shade and take off his shoes, why wouldn't he just use his cell phone to call for help, or even call out to any passerby. And that doesn't explain why his backpack is missing. Maltese authorities concluded that Mike's death was a tragic accident, nothing more. And despite many requests in the months that followed, they refused to reopen the case despite its glaring omissions. Like, why didn't they try harder to figure out the identity of the anonymous caller who told them where Mike's body was? and German investigators didn't get any further. Bernd returned to Malta on several occasions, trying to solve the mystery of his son's death. In November of 2017, he confronted the lead investigator and forensic doctor in Mike's case with a list of questions he felt needed to be answered. But not only did he not receive one straight answer to any of them, but the investigator just wanted to know when he was planning on leaving the island. Baron also went to the Maltese ambassador in Berlin to try to gain full access to his son's case file. And he's more than a little shocked when, the next day, a file arrived at the German Foreign Ministry. Finally, at least now they could see all the information that the Maltese investigators had that they had been unwilling to share so far. But to say that the file they received was incomplete would be a slight understatement. It contained one page. No autopsy report or photos, no eyewitness statements, no photos of the crime scene, even though Baron witnessed police photographers taking tons of pictures of both Mike's body and the entire area. None of this was included in the report. The only page included was a picture of the cliffside with information on the horizontal and vertical distances of Dingley Cliffs in relation to where his body was found. Informative, but sadly not really relevant because the scene was not exactly in question. 
but it did lend credence to the idea that Mike could not have jumped off the cliff above as his body would not have been under the ledge. Bernd was obviously devastated that the crime scene photos were not in the file. He needed those photos to prove that Mike's GoPro was on his belt when he was found, just as the detective told him that day. The question about the GoPro could be answered by looking at those photos. If it was there, then he could finally prove that the Maltese police were hiding something. Now, at the end of January of 2018, Mike's case was reopened in Malta, and four months into the second investigation, in April of 2018, with mounting pressure from the Maltese press, Bernd Manschult finally, finally received the complete 200-page case file on Mike's death. But even then, it must not have contained any new bombshells of information because the investigation concluded the second time the judge in Malta came to the same conclusion that Mike's death was a tragic accident. Now, despite disagreeing with the outcome of the first investigation, the German public prosecutor's office then decided to do a 180 and agree with the Maltese investigators, stating that they now believe that Mike did, in fact, fall off the cliff and die from his injuries. Exactly what did they see in that second report that Bernd didn't that made them change their minds? Or did they just get lazy and decide that since they couldn't figure out how Mike really died, it had to have been an accident? And what about the fact that the second investigation stated that when the body was found, the organs were still in place? Which, of course, contradicts the Maltese Corners rodent story. So, which is it? Now, after countless hours of poring over every little detail, Bernd Manschult had his own theory. He believes that Maltese forensic doctors made a big mistake. Their lead guy, Mario Siri, an award-winning forensic scientist, at one point could actually be seen on a YouTube video bragging about completing the autopsies of 29 refugees who had washed up on the beaches of Malta in three days. However, it looks like that video is no longer available. Bernd believes that Siri did a rushed job of Mike's autopsy and forgot to put his organs back in when he was done, and once he realized his mistake, he either threw the organs away or gave them to the local university for research. Refusing to admit he screwed up, he came up with a story that rodents ate the organs and the brain melted in the hot sun. I mean, if this is the case, it would explain what happened to Mike's organs, but not exactly how he died. Bernd Manschult has put out a reward of 10,000 euros for any information that could answer this question. The same amount is offered for Mike's backpack, his phone, and his GoPro. Now, on September 4th, 2016, two weeks after Mike's 18th birthday, his family scattered his ashes into the ocean. Not only did they feel that this is what Mike would have wanted, but now, whenever they go sailing, they feel like Mike is with them. Mike's family also had a plaque erected at the Dingley Cliffs in Mike's memory and says, Mike Manschult, you are loved and missed. For those of you living under a rock who don't know Josh, there's a link to his channel, What Lurks Beneath, in the description. And as an extra surprise, this is a two-parter. Josh and I have teamed up for another collaboration video over on his What Lurks Beneath channel as well. So click right here to go watch that one now. Thank you so much much, Josh, for being my guest on the episode today. No problem. It was fun. And just remember one thing. What's that? Be careful out there. And we will see you here again on The In-Between. Between.